You know, I never really thought about it much, but some days if I'm tacking up a handrail or some kind of weldment, I'll use these things maybe a couple hundred times a day. Uh, whether I'm MIG welding or TIG welding, after every tack, I usually clip the wire. Especially if it's critical placement or if I'm going to be welding over it and I don't want to see the tack under the weld. And these work great. There's nothing wrong with them. I've been using them for years. I just think I've got a better idea. So as much as I'd like to take credit for this, I can't. This was one of my viewers suggested this to me. And he goes by Three Rivers Forge on Instagram and uh, he does blacksmithing stuff, it looks like, and obviously knows some tricks. So maybe worth checking out. I'll put his name in the description so you guys can find him. If you guys have been watching my channel for a while, you know that I built a vertical table conversion for my horizontal bandsaw for the very purpose of cutting small parts. And this works so much better. This is just a piece of six inch pipe and it's about three quarter ish wall thickness uh, before I board it. And I don't think you need to go this thick, but I did have this laying around and it works really good. It's really rigid. And the cool thing is you get two of them. So yeah, check out uh, Three Rivers Forge on Instagram. Thanks, man.
measure the inside of this slot here on both sides because eventually this part here, there's going to be two of them that slide inside here, kind of like, uh, I don't know, ways, I guess. You know, I could use a, I don't know, I might have a telescopic bore gauge that's small enough to get in here. I think a much more accurate way for slots like this are gauge blocks. And this is probably pretty basic, but I want to show you guys a simple way to figure out your stack of gauge blocks so that you can measure slots. So these are gauge blocks, for those of you that don't know. And all they are is basically precision ground stock that is very accurate with a really good surface finish. Um, you know, this isn't the best set of gauge blocks, but I don't have a machine that can get accurate to the millionths of an inch, and these are ground to that. So these deviations here are plus four, minus 14, plus 23. So these are specs in millionths of an inch. Very accurate and efficient, easy way to stack these that I learned on Tom's Techniques channel. Uh, if you haven't watched Tom's Techniques YouTube channel, even if you're not new, if you're a machinist of any kind, I would highly suggest these videos. Okay, so I wanna make a stack of blocks that fits really well in this groove here. What I was shooting for when I was machining it was 468 thousandths. So we'll start with that. And you have one that has a, that's 108 thousandths. So the last digit is eight, last digit is eight. We'll pull that one out, and we'll write 108. We'll subtract it. Okay, now we have 360 thousandths. So now we're gonna try and get rid of this six. Uh, we have 160 here, so we can use that one. We'll subtract 160 thousandths. 200 thousandths left, which is this one right here. So we were shooting for 468 thousandths, and this is um, half of a 10 thousandth of an inch over that. So that's, that's good enough for for me. <laughs> so we'll see how I did at the mill. So this stack of gauge blocks, if I hit my target, this should just barely go in there. And it does. It just fits really tight and perfectly all the way down. So we're going to machine our sliding parts to just under 468 thousandths. So this is basically like electronic circuit board. It's just a non-conductive material. I think it's fiberglass and some other things mixed in there.
videos ago, I built this ball turner, but I never really showed you anything about it or why I designed it the way that I did. There's only a couple things that make this different than any of the other ones that you see. And that's that I have this leg here that drops down. And what that does is it just gives it a little bit more range. I can do a bigger ball. A lot of the ones I've seen are basically from here over and they just sit right on top of the carriage here. There's nothing wrong with that except for you just can't, there's not, you don't have the clearance to get a larger sphere. So this is the tool holder here. This is just a high speed tool that I ground. And basically how it works is if this cutting edge is from the center line back, then you're cutting a radius. If it was from the center line forward, then you would be cutting a concave feature into your part. So you basically have as far back as you can go without hitting this upright here, and that is the maximum diameter that you can turn. Okay, so how you'd wanna set this up is you get your tool height at the same height as the center of your part, and you want your cutter in line with the spindle. So once you get your cutter in line with the spindle and you have it where you want it height-wise, do not move your X and Y axis. Just back up on the Z, come around, and then slide your cutter out until you're perpendicular with your part, this way. Still not moving your X and Y, just move the tool itself. And once you have it there, back it out, tighten your set screws. Once you clear your part, this is how you're going to advance with your X and your Y. Advance a little, take off the corner, advance, take off the corner. And by the time the cutter gets to the center of your part, you'll have a sphere. So I realize this is a pretty elaborate solution for cutting wire. And honestly, cutting wire isn't the main reason why I decided to go ahead with this project. I have some ideas for some projects coming up that have more elaborate parts that I wanna make out of tool steel and heat treat. And I've never heat treated A2 or D2, and I don't wanna spend hours machining a part and then heat treat it only to find that it cracked or shrunk or distorted in some way. So I figure these blades are a pretty good opportunity to test different heat treatment and tempering cycles. They're gonna see some abuse in here with me pounding on the top and wires. I plan to use this on 
TIG wire also. It'll give me an opportunity to find that perfect balance between hardness and brittleness. The other reason is I'll use this every day, probably more than most tools in my shop. I've also never seen anything like this. Uh, I don't think it's been invented. And by invented, I mean justified for manufacture. So in this video, we're gonna heat treat these two blades. And as far as the geometry on these blades go, right now, they're just flat. I'm gonna try it like that, but I'm guessing after heat treatment, I'll end up putting these on the surface grinder and grinding a little bevel on these. I just wanna do some experimenting and try and figure out the best way to do it. I know that this will cut wire just how it is because I've already tried it even before the heat treat and it works great. After I get the heat treatment figured out, I'll probably go back and heat treat this part and this part, but these have more details and inside corners and things like that. And I wanna play around a little bit before I heat treat these. I also wanna give a shout out to Tom Lipton at Ox Tools. He has a machining channel that's really good and he's dedicated a lot of time into putting these videos together over the years. And the other thing about Tom is, you know, I've emailed him multiple times through trying to learn machining and he always responds to me. I really appreciate that. I got this heat treatment information from HudsonToolSteel.com and Tom Lipton gave me this website. And it's really good information. Just one of the drops from when I made the blades and I didn't temper this one I'm just curious to see how hard it is right after the quench okay so we're looking at 61 Rockwell for those of you who don't know that's somewhere like in the drill bit high-speed steel drill bit range so that's pretty hard I'm curious to know how brittle it is before you temper it and that is why you temper tool steel. Okay, so these are out of the temper, and I'm gonna we're gonna try and break this one again and see if it's any better. And this corner rolled over just a little bit, and it came out of the vise, but it didn't break. I got the blades installed and we're gonna give it a try. This is 332 TIG wire. 1 16th TIG wire. So the blades haven't taken any damage. There's no marks or anything. So that's why I use the layer of fiberglass and the plastic fasteners on the bottom to isolate the cutter from the table so you don't accidentally arc on the blades when you're cutting.
So Yes Welder contacted me on Instagram and asked me if I wanted to try one of their machines. And I said yes, as long as after I used it on my next video, I could send it to one of my subscribers. And I told them I'd give it an honors review and I wanted to send it to one of you guys. And they said okay. And this is the machine right here. And I thought about this a little bit. And the only way I know to do a drawing for all my subscribers is one of those random generators and if your subscriptions are set to private you won't be entered there's you know I just don't know how else to do it so what I was thinking is if you do set your subscriptions to private like I do I totally understand you should go to my Instagram page and follow me on Instagram and the day before I do the drawing I'm gonna make a post and then at least that way you would only have to make your subscriptions public for one day for the drawing and other than that, I just don't know how else to do it. If you do not live in the United States, I will pay up to $100 to ship it to you. Uh, and if it's more than that, you're gonna have to pay the difference. I guess that's about it for this one. I'll see you guys in the next one.